everybody doing tonight? My name is Dean Sather. Um, usually when I'm doing talks like this, I get an introduction like that. I'll come up and I'll start talking like this about how Minnesota was formed by an act of the Territorial Congress. And it usually scares the stuffing out of everybody. Because <laughs> they think I'm going to do that for the next hour, and then they think I could be home watching a wild game. But I want to thank everybody to come out here tonight. Uh, this is one of my passions. I really enjoy this. And I have to commend these two gentlemen here for being part of the best reuse of a country kitchen I've ever seen in my life. Now, I, I've given a couple of lectures on the history of Minnetonka, a little bit of history of the prehistory of the area at previous lectures, and I was asked today to talk about something alcoholic. I don't know why they looked at me and thought that would be apropos, but I figured, okay, we can do this. Let's talk about the archaeology of beer. So that's what we're here talking about, the archaeology of beer, summarized by the guy who's talking. Who is this guy talking? Well, that's me a little while ago. Um, that's actually at an excavation unit that I excavated back in North Dakota in 1989. It's a fortified village out in western, eastern North Dakota called the Shea Site. It's now on the National Register. And that is a bison skull that had been purposely buried where it was. And so there was actually something ceremonial. So this is the first lesson you're going to get about archaeology. If we don't know what it means, it's ceremonial. <laughs> If we can't point to something and say, that's what that's for, we say, oh, it must be a ritual. So that's what it is. I have a master's degree in archaeology from the University of Kansas. I'm a registered professional archaeologist. And what that means is that I paid for both of those things, and you're going to hear about it. I'm a consulting archaeologist working for Wank Associates. Yes, I'm a wanker. And I am a current beer consumer and a past beer brewer. When I was in graduate school, me and my uh, roommates brewed all the beer. We had a cottage industry. We had three carboys going. Every, every weekend, we'd brew another patch of beer. We'd trade for bread and chicken eggs everywhere. I have to get back into the frame of the shot. Hello. <laughs> and we actually were part of that. Uh, I gave all my beer equipment to my niece, who is now brewing beer. So uh, the payment for that is a six pack once in a while. I am a frustrated educator which is why I come out here, and I'm an opinionated. That comes with a degree. It's an MA degree, Master of Arts. That means my master's thesis defense wasn't is to, is not argument. It has nothing but opinions behind it. So that's what you're going to hear tonight. And that also means I'm always right. <laughs> OK, so we'll get the preliminaries out of the way. Why should you listen to me? Tonight, I will not speak about specific gravity. We will not be speaking about the difference between top and bottom fermentation. We will not explain why your choices are flawed. And we will not talk about what is undeniably the best beer in the world. It's true. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. You're a captive audience, so you're mine for the next hour. You're going to listen to me, and you chose to be here. And number three, beer. We're here for beer. The history of beer, or near as we can tell it. It's a path to understanding. Well, where, where, where did that come from? Excuse me for a minute. There we go. When we're looking at it from an archaeological perspective, one of the things that we're trying to understand is what is the history of that fermentation process? Now, what we call beer, we'll get into it in a little bit, actually has a remarkably diversified history. What exactly is beer? We'll talk about in a little bit. But what we want to start with is that fermentation has been part of the human culture since long before history started. There are some people that think that fermentation was actually something that was introduced into human culture as early as the modification of food by fire. So we could be talking almost a quarter million years ago. We probably saw people fermenting things and consuming them. We can see it in nature. I mean, you can go on YouTube, look up drunk elephants. <laughs> you will find elephants that are going to the fruit trees on the savanna, picking up the fruit that has dropped to the ground, sat in the sun for a couple of weeks, fermented under its own power, and you will actually have drunk elephants tooling about the countryside. You think it's bad when the first snow hits here, you ought to be in the savanna during the drunk elephant period. <laughs> Many is, yeah, here's the fire, we got that. Um, every culture on Earth. We need to move this. Oh. 
Oh, I like my own. Can I move? <laughs> Every culture has fermentation. Every continent, save Antarctica, has fermented beverages that were originated on that continent. They are as ubiquitous as flatbreads in every culture, and probably linked to it as well. The investigation of booze is as old as history itself. People have always looked at these things, and so they're trying to come up with a history of what is a fermented beverage. Why is it there? What are the reasons for it? Now, we have our own personal reasons. I have three teenage sons. That's one of my reasons. <laughs> but we're all here for our own thing. I like it because it is not something new. Louis Pasteur, in 1857, passed, wrote a book called The Study of Beer. The Investigations of Beer. This is the guy that was finding out about microorganisms and helped define what that fermentation process was. Taking it out of the realm of magic and actually putting it into this idea of biochemistry. So that was something that has always started. And we are not at the forefront, therefore, of discovering what fermented beverages are. We are not the only people that have asked this question. From an archaeological perspective, however, this is a relatively new undertaking. We've had people talk about the evils of beer, the evils of fermentation, the nastiness that is fermented beverages for years. The temperance movement in the state where I got my undergraduate, my graduate degree is notorious for starting off with the temperance movement, Carrie Nation. All those lovely people came from Kansas. I gather there's a lot of them still there, but that's just another issue altogether. The thing is, one of the reasons that we find that the study of alcohol and beer has not really been pursued is because of a cultural stigma. I mean, until maybe 20, 30 years ago, the idea of studying alcohol was actually tied to this idea that it's something that caused problems. That it was actually an issue that was not the most savory topic. If you talked about alcohol, you were talking about alcoholism, you were talking about people, you were talking about certain issues. And so the entire idea of studying alcohol actually had a connotation that was not for polite society. And so for the longest time, people did not study these things. They were just not considered apropos for investigations. And it's only been like within the last 30 years where we actually start looking at studying the, the history of fermentation, studying the history of beer in the archaeological record that has really taken on its own area of study. Now, we've had things, of course, that have been part of this. And, you know, of course, being an archaeologist, your goal as an archaeologist is to find the oldest, the first, the most important thing in the world. It's never good enough to be boring. I'm from North Dakota. I know this well. But as an archaeologist, one of the things we want to find is the first thing. And so for the longest time, when we looked at the history of beer, the history of fermentation, Mesopotamia was the place where this all started. So you got that fertile crescent between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in the Middle East. That's where you start seeing the first large-scale agriculture, the first large-scale societies, the big cities forming. And of course, part of that was the fermentation process. And we have beer that is showing up. Cuneiform tablets dating to 4,000 BC, 6,000 years ago, that talk about the trade in beer between communities in the Middle East. So even at that point, we're talking about an industry. We're talking about people who are brewing beer, putting it in amphora, sending it across the desert to other locations. They were so enamored of beer, and this is my favorite thing, I love this. I'm gonna say this wrong because I'm a left-handed Norwegian, Ninkasi, the goddess of beer. There is an entire ode to Ninkasi, written in Sumerian about 2,800 years ago. And it is an ode to beer. Ninkasi, you are one who pours out the filtered beer of the collector's vat. It is like the onrush of the Tigris in Euphrates. <laughs> that is a, like, one of 20 stanzas of this ode to Ninkasa. That's how important beer is. Now, the reason I bring that up is because why have a goddess of beer if it's not important? 
why look at these things if they're not significant? Well, being a good archaeologist, Mesopotamia was not good enough. We had to find older deer. We started looking in China. And lo and behold, we found it. I'm not even going to try to say that. I believe it's Zhao in China. <laughs> I'm getting the nod of approval over there, so I got that right. Beer there, look at this, 7,000 BC, 9,000 years ago. So we have these wonderful vessels, that's what they look like, coming from, you know, just south of Beijing, Zhao, and that's where they found actually now the oldest representation of beer on the planet. Now what is this beer made of? Grapes, hawthorn fruit, honey, and rice. So there, we're done. That's, that's the archaeology of beer. It was made 9,000 years ago in China. Fascinating, but so what? <laughs> what do we know about these early brews? Well, like a good gin, they are made out of materials that are immediately available in your surroundings. You need a carbohydrate. You need an enzyme or a yeast. You need those basic things that are going to cause fermentation. It's a natural process. We did not invent anything. We did not discover anything unique. Fermentation is easy. Drunken elephants in Africa, it's an easy thing to do. But the issue was is that those early brews were probably not made exclusively to get people completely schnockered. The idea was is that they were probably an extremely low alcohol content. And the other thing is, is that they usually had a remarkably sour taste because one of the after effects is also this, this rancid alcohol, this vinegar flavor. So they'd probably be extremely sour. And I love this because the ingredients of the fermentation process, they weren't necessarily skimmed. The early brews were probably remarkably chunky or slimy. Mmm. <laughs> That's usually after a bad night of beer. That, folks, is the reason why kids are not appropriate here. I got a kick out of that. So we're talking about this kind of, it's almost like a gruel, this early beer. And so when we're looking at this, you know, what is it for? Well, why beer? Well, number one, okay, we can talk about inebriation. Obviously, when we talk about a cult, this is, we're getting back to this ritualistic thing. When we start talking about things that have effects on people, we look at why people might imbibe these things. And one of the issues is, is that even at a low alcohol content, you, imb in, you imbue enough of it, you might find that there are mind-altering effects with that beer. Now, there are some people that look at that and they say, oh, this mind-altering, this expansion, you know, Timothy Leary kind of look, that they have this ability of expanding the creative juices in our brains. That, you know, we, we, you know, because we, we all know how much smarter we get when we're drunk. <laughs> Three teenage boys. Um, the idea that the creativity is all of a sudden unleashed, that these social norms are released and that we have the ability to just expand the way we view the world. Now, I have a little trouble with that because I don't think Stephen Hawking's got ripped in order to come up with, you know, the idea of black holes. I think that he had a pretty steady mind behind him. I think that one of the things that we're looking at are some of the other reasons. Agriculture. It might be a byproduct of the very nature that we have all of a sudden all these people living in a small area. You know, when you talk about all these tens of thousands of people that used to be nomadic hunters and gatherers all of a sudden living in this small area in the Middle East, this big bang in the Fertile Crescent, there are other things that come into play that need to be answered. Now, some of those things might be more social in orientation. You know, you don't get 20,000 people living in a square mile happily together very easily. It usually requires a little bit of grease. We'll get to that in a little bit. But part of the issue is, is that agriculture, I love this. I mean, these are anthropologists. They're, you know, they're probably drinking a little, getting the creative juices going. They're thinking that maybe part of the reason for the agriculture was not simply 
to make the grain so we could have bread and feed everybody, but actually it was the cottage industry of getting that beer brewed that was actually a, a, a stronger issue that might have gotten people going. Preservation technique. I love this because this is actually something that is extremely important when you look at beer. Carbohydrates, sugars, all these basic nutrients are preserved in beer. And one of the things that happens when you ferment beer is that you actually cleanse the liquid that it is fermented in. You get rid of a lot of the nasty critters that might be living in this water. So one of the things that you're looking at is the fermentation is a way of preserving some of those natural nutrients that come in the grains. Yay bread, liquid bread. But you're also cleaning the water, the liquid that you are drinking. And so if we're not talking about, you know, these wonderful 6% critters here, and we're talking about these issues that are kind of a low nutrient, low alcohol, but have a lot of slurry and they're kind of slimy, it might not be the beer itself that is being produced, but it is actually kind of a stew, a meal that actually preserves itself. Because through that fermentation process, it actually helps preserve. Now, I'm a Norwegian. How many of you know about Ludafisk? <laughs> you want to talk about altering things in order to preserve them? <laughs> what we need to do is soak this in a caustic chemical. We'll eat it later. It'll be fine. But it'll last forever. So this is one of the things we're looking at. It may be a preservation technique. Now, that's the early stuff. You know, this is the stuff in Mesopotamia. This is the stuff in Mesoamerica. This is the stuff in China. That's that preservation stuff. You can make it, you can mix it. It lasts a long time. People can eat it a long time. And maybe even after it's gone for a little while, some of that alcohol leaches off. So it's not as intoxicating. And so it's good for the kids. It is kid appropriate. I don't know why kids can't be here. But it does serve a purpose. And I think that's really important. Because later when we start looking at it, sometimes those alcoholic beverages become status symbols. When we talk about amphora and we talk about the great wine trade that goes on throughout the Mediterranean, we can even talk about some of the beer manufacturing that goes on in Europe. There are different classes of beer that are showing up, made in different locations, they're considered a different status symbol, but the quality of the alcoholic beverages that you're able to produce actually say something about your capabilities as a leader or as a member of your community. And I'm not talking just about, you know, the Roman times. I'm talking about possibly even seven, 6,000 years ago when we start looking at some of these things. Because the second one, the social lubricant fits in with that. How many of you would be here if there weren't beer? Be honest. All right. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. No, but I mean, come on. I mean, one of the things is that this gives us an opportunity to be sociable with one another. But there's a grander scheme on this sociability that comes about with this status symbol and social lubricant. It might be that some of these intoxicating beverages that we see worldwide are not just being constructed for preservation or for sustenance, but they're actually being used to get people to do things. And it might be that leaders in communities, might be hunters and gatherers, it might be small villages, it might be large cities, might be actually getting these materials and compiling them and using them as payment for social activities. And so it could be that the, the status symbol of being able to acquire all of this beverage and being able to then redistribute it to the people who are helping you make something might be this twofold issue. And if we take a look at it from that perspective, we can even apply that back to that Mesopotamian period where all of a sudden we've got 10,000 people living here. How many of us do the same thing? How many of you are consulting archaeologists? Usually there's another one, but you know. We're all doing something different, aren't we? We're all performing a different task. We're all making a living. Now, if you think about that, before the fiat currency and the gold standard, blah, 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 blah. How were people paid? Through making a living, through their sustenance, being able to get something in return for the services. You ready? Okay, off topic. We're going to go into the weeds here. Carl Wittfogel wrote this thing called Oriental Despotism. Snore now, because it's not going to get any better. 
But he talked about the idea that when you have people living in large groups like that, you have to have separation of duties. Because you have separation of duties, not everybody gets to do everything they need to survive, so other people have to help them by giving them things to survive, i.e. there has to be a way of distributing the goods. So all of the people that are out there growing all the food have to pay people that are making the irrigation channels that are feeding the water to the food because they're not making food themselves. And so it just kind of grows on itself. These are the mechanisms by which you might be able to see that happening. The social status and the social lubricant. It happens everywhere across the world. Wow, we're doing this. My favorite example, chicha. How many of you have heard of chicha? See, I've heard about it for so many years, it's just like something I do, chicha. Chicha. It is an indigenous alcoholic beverage from the Andean highlands in Peru. It has been around for about 5,000 years. The archeological evidence, storage and transport vessels, just like we see everything else, social activity, sharing a drink, it's all part of this social network that we have going on. They have these vessels where they're collecting this chicha. They're making, oh, we'll get to that in just a minute. It's a, it's a crop that's made from maize. Now, all of you that know your margarine commercials know what maize is. Some call it corn. This is a product that's made of maize, but it's not the sweet corn. It's not the stuff that you buy at Seavers on the corner of the highway anymore. This is that hard, small cobbed flint corn. This is very tough kernels. These are small. This is the early stages of grass. They farmed the maize because it was becoming a major economic force in the area. Because it was a good food, it was easy to control, you could grow a lot of it. But then again, Carl Woodfogel, we'll bring that back. You had to distribute it. You had to have other things going on. You had to have things done. And so they would often identify that as a sacred crop, but they would also use that as a payment for labor. So you'd get people from different communities to join, to come together, to do things. And they'd use this corn, this maize, and in many cases, this chicha as payment for those activities. It's called mita labor. I wrote a paper on this when I was in grad school. We actually tried to make chicha, and you'll get disgusted in a minute when you find out why. <laughs> When we're talking about some of the things, especially in Highland Peru, Inca Peru, we're talking about a fairly elaborate political system. We're talking about a large community. You know, it's like the Aztecs. I mean, these were large networks of trading networks of communities that lived miles apart. And they all didn't live separate from one another. They actually did things communally. And one of the things that they would often do, just like in Aztecs, just like in Central Valley of Mexico, you would find that communities would come together on occasion to build these elaborate architectural pieces. Now, in some of the, you know, you get to Machu Picchu, you get to some of the larger Cuzco, you get to some of these larger Incan, in, uh, they, they'd actually build them out of stone. They were very elaborately carved and very well fitted together stone. But in some of the areas, especially in the Highland Desert area, you would actually see that some of this architecture was being made out of brick, mortar, brick and mortar. So they'd actually create bricks. But what you'd see is that you'd, you'd have this beautiful, you know, temple. This is the Temple of the Sun in Veracruza. But then each tier, you have the foundation here made out of limestone and rock. But then you have the walls made out of those brick, those hand forged bricks. And oftentimes what you'd find is that there would be communities that would travel miles and miles and sending contingents of people to help build these monuments. And they've been able to do this because as they've excavated into some of these things, they will actually find that like 10 foot wide columns of these walls all have a similar stamp into the brick. And it's like that's that community stamp they're saying we built this part of this temple. And so there might be 10, 15, 20, Lord knows how many people that have come from someplace 50 miles away to help build this temple. Now we're getting back into that social stratus. We're talking about the social lubricant because somebody had to get all these people, convince all these people to show up. 
And then he had to keep them happy enough to build what they needed to build. And some people think that chicha was one of the payment items that was used to placate the folks. A fine alcoholic beverage made of corn, which was readily available. So what is chicha? It's made from corn. Like I said, it's not the normal corn that one would expect. It's not the sweet corn, so you don't, it's not the cream corn from Del Monte. Oh, sorry, green giant. It's the flint corn. It's the very hard kerneled corn. I mean, it's dry. When you harvest this stuff, it, is not, it does not have any water in it left at all. This is the highland desert. So, I mean, all the water out of it. So what they have to do in order to get chicha to start is they have to germinate that corn kernel. Now, keep in mind, they're in the highland deserts. And so one of the things that they don't really have an abundance of is moisture. And so in order to get these corn kernels to germinate, they will actually collect this flint corn and put it under the mattresses of their bed. And as they sleep, the, the moisture of the sweat of their body and the heat of their body will actually leach down into the corn and actually help germinate those corn kernels. And as they're doing this, they will see that the little green shoots, you know, just as that corn starts to germinate, that little green shoot comes right out of that kernel. And that's when you strike. Because that means that they've started to create enzymes. They've actually started to germinate. So they've got a chemical process going on in that flint, in that corn kernel, that says there's active chemistry going on. So that's exactly what they're looking for. So they, they you know, it's like, it's the chicha starts in a dream. It's this beautiful flint corn that is germinated by the sweat and heat of the human body. What more nature could you get there? It's coming. In order to process the maize, you have to chew it. You have to break it down. And one of the ways that they would do this, not one of the ways, the way that they would do that is that they would actually chew those germinated kernels. And so they will actually take that and they'll take the kernels and they'll chew the kernels and mash them up, masticate. And the saliva that they would make as they were chewing these corn kernels would actually mix with the kernel. And so they'd get this fine paste, this masa, that they would then spit into a vat. Anybody want another beer? <laughs> they would expectorate the maize into a vat. Now keep in mind, this is one of those social events. So this is something that, you know, when we talk about, you know, the early fermentation, remember Nilkasa? Ninkasa, female deity in Mesopotamia. It's very likely that the production and fermentation of the brew from Mesopotamia and even China was probably within the realm of women's work. That was part of their daily task. And it's very likely that as these communities were coming together, the men would be obligated to go participate in the construction of that architecture, and the women would be back at camp producing chicha. So they would bring their corn kernels, they'd bring their, they'd masticate the corn, they'd spit it into a vat, and they'd add water. And I, now think about this. They'd allow it to ferment, usually about two days. But here's the kicker. We're talking about how easy fermentation is. And he's over there eating. <laughs> no, he's not even listening. Anyway, listening. okay. <laughs> no, I'm just just griefing you. Just griefing you. Keep in mind that they're 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 doing this. This is not a small group of people. When you're thinking about twenty or thirty people from each village coming to this area, and then you've probably got about 10 or 15 of these communities sending people, you're talking about upwards of 300 people that are all coming here to build this architecture. You can imagine the level of production that would have to go on with this technique in order to get a fermented beverage in the quantity enough to keep everybody happy and consider it a valid payment for the social services that they are providing for the status member of their community to build that temple. You can add corollary ingredients. This is one of the fun things about chicha, is that it is something that you see from the Andean highlands all the way up to the southwestern part of the United States. 
This is an alcoholic beverage that is well received throughout Central America. And it is just like every other fermented beverage that we talked about, made obviously with a base of corn, but then all of the other ingredients that go into it are actually the things that you can find locally. Sage, coriander, yams, peppers. I mean, you could probably get some pretty scorching brew out of some of this stuff with some of the peppers that are growing down there. But this is one of the things that would happen is that here's a fermented be um, beverage and it is so indigenous, but it has such an importance to this community that it actually not only becomes this opportunity to create an, an intoxicating beverage, but once you've swapped spit with everybody in your county, you're pretty much blood at that point. <laughs> and I'm not saying that to, I mean, I mean, think about it. After fermentation, I mean, the enzymes. I mean, this is the whole idea is that the enzymes in your saliva are acting like the yeast in that fermentation process. It is modifying all the sugars and starches and carbohydrates that are in there. They are modifying that entire juice into this intoxicating beverage. They are conforming, reconfiguring that product into something that becomes this communal property. And it is something that everyone shares. And it becomes that social lubricant that ties people together. Now, I'd like to tell you that we were successful in creating Chicho when we were in high school. We don't know if it was successful because we couldn't get anybody to try it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, being left-handed Norwegians from North Dakota going to graduate school, I'm not convinced we used the right corn. <laughs> but we do know that we had chemistry going on at one point. And it did smell quite potent. And I do know that in some cases, the chicha that you can make is remarkably powerful. And so when you start looking at this and you start thinking about all of this large architecture that goes on worldwide, from the Val you know, from the, the Nile Valley to the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Mesopotamia, to the highlands of Peru, to the very central areas of the Mississippi River in the United States, these intoxicating beverages were part of the central core of cultural baggage that everybody had just like that flatbread, you know, the lefsa that we have, the tortillas, potato tortillas as we call them at home. These are things that are part of that cultural norm and I think it's really important to keep that in mind because you serve it to a willing public. Now, this is the fun part because, you know, I, I, I use this example because I mean, it really does buck against the norms of anything that we would consider <laughs> acceptable. You know, I know that I chewed steak for my young Indian children at some point, but it's not something I would do for my wife or any of you kind people here, no matter how much you begged. <laughs> but the issue is, is that it's part of that cultural norm, and that's one of the reasons that we like to look at these things, is because it's not just, I don't like just telling the story about Chicha because I want to get people to go, oh my God, that's disgusting. <laughs> but to recognize that the process that brought Chicha into that culture was tied to an understanding of what their community was. And I think that is the story that we can tell about the archaeology of beer and why over the past 20 years this has become so important. Because it's the history of, tell, it tells us who we are and gives us a little bit more of an understanding of how we got here. My favorite one is, remember those early beers? You know, they had honey, they had rice, they had fruit, they had all this stuff. They were chunky, they were slimy. A lot of the fermented beverages for the first 9,000 years of human history that we can record were probably these chunky, greasy, thick messes. And that's the stuff that people would produce in their homes. It's the stuff that people would produce in their communities. It was the stuff that their communities joined together to partake in. If when you start getting bureaucrats, that you actually start seeing the separation of some of these not intoxicating beverages. 500 years ago, how many of you are German? Raise your hand if you got German blood in you. Everybody get a good look at these people, we're gonna beat them up after the lecture. <laughs> 500 years ago in Germany, they passed a law that beer had to have water, grains, and sugar. <laughs> That's why we drink beer like this today. Prior to that, there was the intermingling between meads. 
There was honey and beer. There was fruit and beer. But now all of a sudden, we have nothing but grains and sugar, yeast and water. We're getting back to this idea that we can join things together. But think about it. Mead, made with honey. Beer, made with grains. Wine, made with grapes. We're finally getting past that. We're bringing it back. So the reason that we have some of the beers that we won't mention is because of the Germans. So put your hands up again and we'll get you in the parking lot. <laughs> what does this have to do with archaeology? Oh crap, here comes the theory part. <laughs> this is where I get to use my degree. We have, like I mentioned, over the past 20 years, seen an invigorated aspect of research into fermentation, in particular beer. And part of that is because we're getting more adept at finding out things about who we are and how we can go about researching these. And we'll get to that one on the next slide, but we won't do it right now. New tools to reconstruct prehistory and history as well. It's not just a bunch of fat old white guys standing around going, well, I think it's because uh, Bob did it. You know, I mean, we're coming up with a lot of different ways of finding out about history. We're talking to the people that partook in history. We're actually excavating those areas that aren't necessarily tied to the movers and shakers. We're looking for those people that aren't recorded in history. We're going back to the basic roots of what we're looking for. We're trying to understand what is the history that isn't written down and how is that recorded in the archaeological record. And that is as simple as there's a guy named Bill Rathje. I don't know if anybody you ever heard of him. This is a guy from the 1960s and 70s who took this to heart and actually started excavating modern landfills in Tucson. Excavating back into the deposits from the 1920s. And the whole idea was to try to find out if the recorded history that we had of that period was replicated in the trash that people actually left behind. We lie like pigs. We tell the stories that we want to tell that kind of tell our story that we want to tell. We don't tell them that we threw this hot dog away and we had a bite out of it. We don't tell all the stories of everything. And that's why the archaeology is really important. I have to get back. There we go. We tell these stories and we find out about things so that we can write that unwritten history. We can go back and retell that story. That's what the new tools to reconstruct history is. We offer new interpretations. Remember I told you for the longest time, people wouldn't investigate alcoholism. They wouldn't investigate drinking because it was tied to this idea that if you drank, you were bad. There's a stigma that goes along with drinking that only recently has been lifted. And it's through a social understanding of what some of the impacts of alcoholism are and what the impact of alcohol is on the human body. But we're getting new interpretations of that. And with that also come a new interpretation of how we might look at the impact of fermentation and alcohol on the human culture. And we're teasing out new understandings of how we used features in our past. This is the key one because the next slide is going to make you fall asleep. We are actually able to start asking different questions and we can start putting things back together that maybe we didn't automatically associate with one another in the past. Maybe some of these features that we now might recognize as indicative of a large scale fermentation process weren't actually troughs for animals. Maybe we can start putting a different spin on the archaeological record and see something different in that record. And I think that's one of the key ones. Because, oh crap, here comes the science part. <laughs> I love this. Infrared spectrometry, tandem liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry, ion cyclotron resonance and solid phase micro extraction gas chromatography. Yeah, I've only had two of those, so that's why I can do that. You know, the issue is, is that these are all tools now that all of a sudden we can use. When we talked about being able to identify these alcoholic beverages in 9,000-year-old deposits in China, it's not because there was a Blatz label on this, on this jar. It's because they were able to take this pottery and they were able to put it into this device and actually see all of the chemicals that were preserved within that pottery. 
Regardless of what anybody thinks, when you fire pottery, it does not become impermeable. It soaks up some of that liquid and it preserves it long term. And so now all of a sudden we can find these potsherds at these archaeological sites. We can actually put them into some of these remarkably elaborate million dollar cyclotron burn thingy and turn it on and really smart people will tell you, well, that's a complex carbohydrate. And we can go through and we can actually identify the various organic chemicals that are preserved in those pieces of pottery. And what we're finding is that it's not all dinty more beef stew. <laughs> we're actually finding out that there are a number of things being preserved in these and in a number of cases, they are actually intoxicating beverages dating back to 9,000 years old. And so that's why I put all of that in for But at the base of it, we get back to the basics of what we're trying to do. Excavate those sites and analyze those artifacts. Because that's where this all starts. We dig stuff out of the ground and we tell stories about what people were doing in the past. That's what this is all about. We're working with a large time period that had no photographs. The stuff that is written down, most of us can't read, but it tells that story. And that's what's really fun about this. Why bother? They're all dead. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty much my dad's answer to why I got into archaeology. <laughs> See previous topic, theory crap. That's the big one right there. Dogfish head theory. You guys familiar with those guys? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you have any? <laughs> these guys started back in 1997. They worked with a lot of these microbiologists, a lot of these guys that are doing archaeology in China, doing archaeology in the Middle East, doing archaeology in Norway, doing archaeology in Iceland, doing archaeology everywhere. And they're finding all of these ethnographic records, but they're also finding archaeological evidence of this fermentation process. And they're finding these individual and very unique opportunities. And they're trying to reconstruct some of these original recipes. I told you about the cuneiform tablet, one that tablet that I showed you, that is actually a recipe for the beer that they used to make. And so this dogfish, Brewery, Dogfish Head Brewery, actually initiated back in 1997 a history of ancient ales where they started reconstructing these recipes and actually producing replicas of these old brews. And the fun thing is, is that it's expanding. I mean, look at what's going on in Minnesota right now. Look what's going on nationwide. There is a remarkable resurgence in this opportunity of craft brewing. And you can't go to a single brewery and find the exact same thing. Each one has a signature. Each one has a specialty. And that's what we're finding in the archaeological record now. We're finding that specialty. We're finding that craft. And we're bringing it back and we're telling those stories. The stories are what I always come back to because I'm an archaeologist. I used to work in museums. And that is the only reason any of this that's the only reason any of us give a rat's fanny about any of this stuff. Because we can all be disgusted by the idea of drinking somebody else's spit in the highlands of Peru. <laughs> but it's something we all share. And it's a story you now know. But you now know something a little bit more about people that lived in the prehistoric Andean mountains. These are the stories we want to tell. And that's why we tell stories, drink old ales, so that we can make new stories. That's what this is all about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if there are any other if there are any, look at that, 10 minutes early, just enough time for uh, questions and answers. If anybody has any questions, I'm going to caveat it right now. They're my opinions, I'm right. If anybody wants any of the information, I mean, seriously, all you need to do is look at Googling anything that goes up here. Seriously, look up the Ode to Beer. Look up the Ode to Ninkasa. It is an amazing piece of literature. It's remarkable. Sir? I have a question for you. It has to do with cracking what's in saliva, such as bacteria. Are you able to pull up stuff from the analysis that says this is 
the kind of bacteria and potential infections and disease that people have back then from that? That's really tough because generally when you're doing the fermentation process, you're seeing a breakdown of a lot of the organics. And because it was a, it, it was a temporary process, a lot of that stuff was just destroyed. And especially in the highlands, unless it's mummified, you don't really get that preservation. So you can get a lot of that stuff from the mummies that are up there, but from some of that other stuff, you're not gonna get a lot of the biology. You can get the organic chemistry from it, but usually you're looking at ratios of different chemicals to try to figure out what that combination was and rebuild it from there. So you don't get that one-to-one -one saying that this is the complex carbohydrate that came from this strain of corn. I love it, yeah, it's, it, and again, just an opinion. <laughs> Otzi? Otzi? Actually, they could. I, I, I would imagine that they can. I mean, they've been able to go in and find out more. I mean, the bog people that are coming out of Denmark, I mean, they've actually been able to go into the stomach and find the contents. And I think there's, there's this one, I think it's the Toland man. Yeah, Toland man. I mean, they've done an amazing amount of research and they actually found that in the last meal this man had was burnt bread. Burnt bread and unprocessed grains. They think he was actually a prince that was um, sacrificed and put into the bog because the meal that he ate is actually a legend that predates Tolan Man. And so they think that he actually, the burnt bread and the grains were a sacrificial meal and then he was garroted and sunk into the bog purposely. Yep. But, they are able to go back and get some of that. I mean, for some of the mummification, they're pretty heavily chemicalized. Yeah. You know, like King Tut, there's a lot of stuff that happened to him. I mean, you'd have to bring bits and pieces back yeah. to actually try to reconstruct that. Yeah, the Coptic jars, I love that. Because where, where was the soul? Soul was in the heart, so they had to pull the brain out through the nose. This is why it's not appropriate for children. <laughs> well, I would imagine the question is when did they learn how to strain this stuff? When did they learn when did they start straining some of this stuff out? <coughs> I would imagine that the first time a kid like mine was born into culture and they looked at that and went, uh, no, that's not going to happen. Um, I would imagine that they always strained it, but I figured that just for the ease of keeping everything in a vat and making it communal, it's just the way it worked. Some people may have strained it themselves. Um, there are some cases, and they think like even with Tolan Man, that, that that grain that they had was actually the remnants that they would actually wring out the remnants and they'd eat the grain after they had done it fermented. So in some cases, they would actually strain that and use that as a meal itself. But when? Soon after the discovery of cheesecloth. Yes, ma'am. So, how long has the group been being grouped as people? Probably about fifteen hundred years or more. Yeah, and I, I would I would default to the the, the I would default to the, uh, experts on that. But I would say that probably in terms of what we're looking at as beer, as that we're probably looking at about fifteen hundred years. Yeah, not chunky, not that. And the issue there is also the preservation techniques. That, that was a big part of it. Until they invented kegging, they really had trouble. So. You know, beer, what is beer the oldest intoxicating beverage? It's impossible to say. And the whole idea is it goes back to the drunken elephant issue. Because the fermentation process is a very simple, natural process, it's very likely that the first fermented or the first sought after fermented um, beverage was probably that rotten fruit. It was probably something that, it was probably scavenged more than it was actually produced. And so it's probably a very you know, logical thing to go from this, here's this papaya that's on the ground fermenting. <laughs> You know, that's like looking at an oyster for the first time saying, I'm going to eat that. You know, <laughs> rotten papaya, it's got to be good for you. But the whole idea is that, you know, I always took umbrage when I was in college because people would say that someone invented agriculture. No one invented agriculture. We got duped into it. 
you know, the, the people that were bouncing around the neighborhood going from, you know, food source from food source, they weren't stupid. They knew their environment. They knew exactly what they were up against and they knew what they had to do to survive. And so when all of a sudden they found out that they could grow grains, it became easier, it became less time investment, it was a little bit more reliable, they got into that. The same thing with fermentation. They knew what happened to fruit when it fell on the ground. They knew what happened. So it's not very difficult to think, okay, we can collect this when it's still good, put it in a vat, let it ferment, and we will actually concentrate that, and we can start that process on our own. And then when you think about it, if they understand that, it's probably just a hop, skip, and a jump. What came first, beer or bread? Was bread a batch of beer that didn't go well? <laughs> Right. Is it something that just didn't work and all of a sudden instead of getting this nice chunky brew, you get this gelatinous mass? There you go. So, I mean, it's, these are all byproducts of probably things that everybody knew about. They just started concentrating them. Oldest, I would probably say a straight ethanol fermentation from fruit would probably be the oldest fermented beverage that was regularly made and sought out. Two minutes. <laughs> Bueller. <laughs> Thank you all so very much. I appreciate this opportunity. <laughs> Thank you to the West Tonka Historical Society. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, folks. Hi, all you folks on cable access. And be sure to drink far more of these intoxicating beverages and pretend it's chicha. Be communal. Tell some stories and make some new ones. Thanks, folks.